Organized crime, the mafia, Whitey Bulger, John Gotti. Some of this country's biggest investigations have been into organized crime, but it's possible that you've never heard of this one, the corporation and Jose Miguel Battle. Well, you're going to hear about it today from someone who was right in the middle of an 18-year investigation, one of the biggest organized crime operations in the world. Welcome to Nothing But The Truth, the podcast about investigations and how you can become a better detective. This is the no BS, no Hollywood nonsense real deal. Now here's your host, Detective Rom. Welcome back. It's episode five of Nothing But The Truth, and I'm your host, Detective Rom, Ramesh Nyberg, and this is Nothing But The Truth, the podcast that makes investigations better by helping you become a better investigator. And we're going to explore some exciting stuff today. We have a veteran detective on board as a guest to talk about one of the most incredible organized crime cases you've ever heard of. Before that, I want to quickly tell you how to get a hold of me, truth at nybergpi.com, truth at n-y-b-e-r-g-p-i, like private investigator.com. You can also contact me on Twitter at nybergpi, or you can join Patreon, become a patron of the show, and learn about all the cool things that you can benefit from, some of the perks of being a patron of the show. And it doesn't matter whether you want to contribute or not. I'm glad you're here listening. And we're going to get right into it. Today's show is the first time we've ever had a guest interview on, and I'm very excited about it. You know, there's a lot of investigators out there who handle big cases, who help take down big crime organizations. One case I can tell you about that I was involved with was Whitey Bulger and the Winter Hill Gang out of Boston and the many murders and other uh, organized crime activities they were involved with. And that's one of the more famous things, right? There's books and movies about that. One of the organizations you've probably never heard of was the corporation. The name Jose Miguel Battle is not so well known, but after today's interview, I think you're going to find out a lot and know a lot more about who this person was and what impact he and his organization had on the criminal landscape in the United States. Boy, I tell you, it's been a rough week for me, eight days since I did the last episode, and the first four episodes were spaced out about four days apart. But what happened was I had to have surgery on a couple of hernias that popped up over the years, and they were getting problematic, and, well, surgery's no fun, and neither is the aftermath. So hobbling around trying to feel better, and this is the result, is this raspy voice that uh, I can't seem to... uh, to project very well. So forgive me for that. If you can struggle through that, I will. And we'll get to this very interesting interview. My guest is David Shanks. He's a 33-year veteran of the Miami-Dade Police Department. He worked in many different areas of the police department for over half of his career. He dedicated himself to one of the most challenging and voluminous organized crime cases that we had ever seen in this country. David, welcome to the show. Thanks for being on Nothing But The Truth. How are you today? Oh, I'm doing fine. It's I'm I'm happy to talk to you. I mean, we've known each other for a long time. I can't, I, I I think 1980 is when you started working for me. We worked together on a surveillance squad, and um, we did a lot of good work and had a lot of fun, didn't we? We did have a lot of fun. I mean, we did a lot of good work. I mean, uh, we followed the crime trends, and we'd sit out there for hours or days looking for someone just to commit uh, one of the targeted crimes. And uh, I mean, it, it helped reduce the crime rate in our, in our area quite a bit. So it was, it, was, it was a lot of fun. We had a really good group, including you and a couple, a couple other people. Finally, I moved on to other things that they, they continued that unit for a while. I don't know, it, it, I think it got absolved into something else eventually. And from there, I went uh, on to the, the Organized Crime Bureau in the vice section. The tenet of organized crime investigations is they all their money that they that they get as a basis for other crimes and other activities comes from you know one of three things or one all of them either illegal gambling, uh, uh, prostitution. Or, or white collar crimes, and they they usually take that money, and and at least the history has been is then gone into taking it to finance drug transactions and other serious things. So, um, you know, so the way that 
in the vice section, our our focus was to try to build into the more upper echelon of the organized crime in South Florida and in the eastern United States is through Ill, illegal gambling op, uh, operations. You got tips and, you know, you knew some of the, 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 the minor players and you try to work those cases up into, you know, higher echelons. Uh, a lot of the times you'd hit a dead end. So then what you do is you just, you would just execute search warrants and prosecute those people and hope that you can, you know, get information either from their records or from uh, deals, you know, cutting, uh, cutting deals with them to, for information, get it to get a reduced sentence on their, on their crime. So that's how I started. I started working a, the small cases. Um, uh, and I very quickly, I, uh, it was like, I was, it was like something that came very naturally to me. I got very, I got very good at it very quickly. If you could fill us in a little bit about Bolita, what is that, and where did it start? Well, Bolita is the is the Spanish word for it, but it's really a lottery, and uh, lotteries have legal lotteries have been in around not only in, in Cuba but in the United States going back to the Revolution. Um, you know, it, it, it's. It's basically the you know the, the the state what the state has got into the uh, cash three and the the lotto and all of the things where you where you know you draw a number weekly or biweekly and you know you put down money and there's a there's you know the, the odds are stacked in the favor of the person who's doing the lottery uh, in the case of like the Florida lotto or the Missouri lotto or wherever. You know the, the the money, the excess money goes to to a tax support, usually schools or something like that. But in the case of the illegal lotteries, they're just going to the organized crime organizations where they 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 take that money and they put it into other crimes. It looks like there's a very innocent face, but then there's kind of an invisible empire behind it, right? Yeah, exactly. It is an invisible empire. And point of fact, we saw when Florida uh, Florida Lotto came in. Um, uh, the cash three originally uh, I was there uh, in uh, organized crime and we actually saw that instead of decreasing the amount of betting that was going on in uh, the illegal operations, it actually it had the uh, reversed effect. It increased because there was more exposure to it and the, the, the illegal operations had two different things going to it. I mean, you had the, Operations that uh, that were run by uh, you know Hispanic, uh, primary Cuban Americans. Then you also had the you know the the, the Native Americans, and I'm not referring to to the, the tribes out of the Miccosukee. I'm talking about people who were uh, Anglo's, uh, Afro Afro Americans. You know they had their own way of the style of doing it that pre-existed. Uh, you know, Belita being brought over from Cuba after the after uh, Bay of Pigs. They're going on with the fact of you have a chance of winning, you know, 70 out of 100 percent or 60 out of 100 percent. You know, they're willing to pay out that 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 off times that bet of, you know, 7 percent. And then they keep that 30 percent and they just build bigger and bigger piles behind them. And uh, what I found in doing this is that. The smaller operators, they would have to what we used to call lay off, which means they, they'd have to when they get too much money on one particular number, they would have to then pass the bet on to somebody who had a lot more a larger bank behind them, and then you got a larger bank behind that and behind that, and eventually you'd 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 hit the organized crime families of one sort of another. If you can go into a little bit about organized crime in Cuba. And why it's important to this story? Battle was um, was a Havana policeman before Ca uh, before Castro. He was the, he was there in Havana as a sergeant in the <laughs> vice uh, squads of Havana during the Batista regime. And a, a corrupt official, he was the bag man. He was the guy who took the the skim, the money that was being paid to the Cuban government officials from the Italian mafia, which is oper operating openly down in Havana bef before the uh, Cuban revolution, 
uh, to the government officials, including the, the president. Uh, president of the country, uh, Batista. So he had gotten uh, used to a very good lifestyle because for the service, he, he, get, he, got a, he got a small percentage for being the go-between, you know, the bag man, the go-between between, between the American, uh, the Meyer Lanskys, the, Sato, the Santos Traficantes, senior and junior, uh, all of the different players that were down in, in, in Havana uh, during that period of time. So um, when the when the revolution came, Battle's uh, easy road was over with. Um, he was reduced from being a uh, you know a well placed corrupt official to being a, a bridge and road inspector, which he didn't like at all. So when that happened, uh, Jose Miguel Battle, uh, like many other Cubans at the time fled to Miami and he decided that he was going to, he'd heard about the brigade uh, 8506 being formed. So he went from Miami to New York. It was being uh, recruited by the, the CIA and uh, he, he was recruited and, and joined it and went down to training down to uh, Central America. He was known as extremely fierce fighter. And um, although not one who always followed the rules, in fact, one of his his brigade twenty five oh six mates told me that you know he was known as one of the best fighters uh, before the landing. When the Bay of Pigs landing occurred, right after the Kennedy administration took over, Battle became known as the hero of the Bay of Pigs. The CIA had landed paratroopers inland to secure bridgeheads. So that when they did break out and these guys got cut off, so Battle uh, grabbed a 50 caliber machine gun, a truck, he said, I'm going to go in and get these guys because they're going to all get killed. And he recruited about four or five other soldiers from the brigade. And that's what they did. They went in and they charged into thousands of Castro's troops and um, they rescued those paratroopers. So he's known in the Cuban community, when I was growing up, he was known as the bravest man at, uh, on the on the Bay of Pigs. So after uh, they all surrendered, he um, had been wounded, and uh, he got thrown into the, the the prisons with the rest of the the Bay of Pigs detainees, and he became a a, a kind of a, a leader in the in the prison of all the all the soldiers who would get captured. Eventually, the United States decided that the, the best thing to do was to get these uh, soldiers released since the CIA was behind it. And they ransomed them and their families uh, to Castro, and they were all released after about a year and a half. How does battle assimilate into life in the United States? Well, um, all, the, all the Bay of Pigs, uh, the 2506 veterans, uh, were all after recuperating, were all offered uh, positions in the United States Army. Um, Battle was, was technically a second lieutenant in the brigade, and 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 held uh, a commission in the U.S. Uh, Army Reserve as a second lieutenant. So he, for a year and a half or so, he took the uh, United States up on that off. He went to. Um, he went to, um, I think Benning, if I remember correctly, went to Fort Benning, and trained as a as an artil as a uh, tank corps officer, and wasn't very successful. His English wasn't that great. As I said before, he he wasn't one who to follow orders really well. I mean, he was a good leader, if you know the type of person I'm talking about. He was a great leader of men, but when ordered to do things, you know, he, he wasn't so good. So after about after a year and a half, he and the army uh, split up and went their separate ways. After he separated from the army, um, Battle went to Santos Traficante Jr. Uh, and basically said, listen, um, I want to form my own family underneath the Italian mafia in South Florida and in the New York City and uh, northern New Jersey area. So uh, 
you know, we're operating in South Florida was really not a problem because for the, all the five families, South Florida, you know, Fort Lauderdale, Miami, and that area, it was declared open city. Anybody could open uh, operate in the in the Italian mafia in those areas without conflict because they it was very important going back to the the days of of prohibition. Miami and Tampa were very important that everybody was allowed to operate without saying this is my territory, that's my t- my territory or your territory, whatever. So that was no problem. But San, uh, Traficante took battle and met with the the, the five Godfathers uh, in from New York City, and um, they agreed that he could operate in their areas, and but he would pay a percentage of profits to the to the five families. And for the right to operate, as long as they didn't, as long as they operated in separate areas, which was fine because there was a big influx, influx of Cuban refugees into Miami. And the other place that they that they went to was New York City and Union City in nor- northern New Jersey. So Battle knew that he had this ready available clientele who would rather, you know, bet illegal uh, gambling with a fellow Cuban than an Italian American. And he set up his organization very much like the Italians. So Battle knew that if he set this organization up, that he had ready-made clientele for him. There was all these uh, Cuban Americans who grew up. They weren't Cuban American times. They were Cuban refugees who grew up with Belita, a lottery. Uh, In Cuba, it 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 was normal. So he just knew that he could he could operate very profitably if he got into the neighborhoods and set up his his organization, which he did. So he set up in three areas primarily: New York City, Union City in northern New Jersey, and in Miami. And uh, he was very successful. He had a very very large market share of of this illegal gambling going on. Um, and point of fact, skipping forward into two thousand and seven. Uh, I, I was that we did a I did a financial analysis of how much money his organization made, and being conservative, uh, I came up with a figure of one point four billion dollars over a thirty year period of time. A billion with a B. Yeah, with a B. About, right. And that was I was being conservative in that number because we were trying to we didn't want a defense attorney to um, shoot it down saying oh you shot for the moon. We went I went with the the lowest numbers possible and still came up with $1.4 billion. So how do you start making a dent in an organization that has, that has amassed that kind of fortune? Well, it, it started, um, you know, I had already had put a couple, a couple good cases under my belt, which didn't uh, lead uh, upwards as it were. Um, they hit dead ends. So we did, um, we did search watch on those. And then we did a case that involved a, a, a crossover where it had um, Native Americans and Hispanic Americans involved in the operation. It, it, was, it wasn't one side or the other, as it were. And um, when we did the search warrant on the place, on the house, they were using a duplex. It was really interesting because they were actually there's two ways to operate illegal lotteries, at least in the day that I did it. One was the the uh, Native Americans didn't trust telephones as much as giving them a slip of paper that said, you bet on this number. And when you won, you turned that slip of paper in and you got your money back. The Hispanic, the Cuban Americans quickly adapted to the telephone system where pe- people out on the streets would take bets and they would call them into the counting house and, or they would people would call into somebody in somebody's houses and where they were taking bets, and they would then relay them to the counting houses. So we, I did the search warrant on this counting house, uh, and it was it really confounded us because it was a duplex, and they they took the paperwork into one side, but then they exited another. And I remember we having to go go to the city see if they'd created an eagle pass through from one duplex to the other, and then I found out it was a simple thing where it went in the front door of one duplex, came out the back door of the other, and then went in the back door of the of the first duplex. How did you get your first good lead on this case? Well, what happened was after I've been in uh, or, or OCB for about a year or so, um, I had pulled off a number of good small cases 
I had started to build a reputation as being a, as a, a solid investigator. And I got this one case, which came from a tip line, uh, about an operator by the name of Jose Polito, who was, who, who had a, a hybrid operation. And so we had both telephone operate, telephones going in there and we had, um, physical tickets that were being collected every night and being taken in there. And it was a duplex on Northwest 34th Street, just east of uh, 22nd Avenue. We it, it had presented some problems because they were bringing in records in one duplex and then exiting the night in another duplex. And uh, it, it kind of drove me crazy for a little while. So we eventually, uh, me and another detective, ended up, a female detective, ended up walking our dog her dog in front of the place during the time when they were making deliveries. And we figured out that they, they were going in one duplex, going out the back door of that duplex and entering the back door of the second duplex. So we knew we had the right place and we hit it. So we, uh, when we collected all the records, we found a, a, a treasure trove of telephone logs of, of all these different contacts in South Florida in the, in that Polito had dealings with. And, we had working in organized crime a retired IRS agent who would do our financial analysis of the of the different operations that we hit. But anyway, I turned all these records that I took from this search warrant of Mr. Polito's Polito operation and turned it into him. And about two days later, he came to me and he goes, "Do you know what you've hit into?" And I says, "No. I figured it was something big because of all of the all these you know." intricate records that he had. And he says, well, if you've hit into uh, one of the smaller operations that's tied into Jose Miguel Battle. And he showed me in the records, this, um, this notations where he's saying we're, we're paying FL, uh, paying, paying off El Gordo, his percentage. Uh, there was another, another reference to the Godfather. So, uh, we immediately knew that that was they were talking about Jose Miguel Battle. So we tried to get Polito to to talk. Uh, he was he'd been he'd been arrested a couple of different times by the city of Miami for the same thing, and he was facing five or six years. Uh, I think maybe it was even seven years because of his third conviction. We put it to the uh, to him through his attorney. Listen, you talk about your connections to 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 Battle. And, you know, we'll we'll work with you on the sentencing. And the attorney came back and said, Mr. Polito said he will tell you anything about anybody except that guy, because that guy will kill you if he finds out that you're snitching on. him. So we knew we were on the right. I knew it was on the right track. What was the next investigative step here? Well, I started a, a, an extensive analysis of of all these telephone contacts that Polito had kept including his tapes of the different conversations of people calling in and him calling out. And we actually ran the tapes through a, a machine that we used during, for wiretaps, and it was able to and identify uh, a lot of the telephone numbers from the beeping codes that it recorded. So I had all this information. I had, I had piles of this information, which I thought at the time was just unbelievably large. In retrospect, when I've, Years later, it was it was minuscule of the of the records that I collected. But we went through it and we started identifying people that that Polito contacted who were um, known associates of Jose Miguel Battle in South Florida. And so one of the things that we did, we found out through different informants that Battle was a, a big uh, fighting cock aficionado. He had his own. He had a, a farm out in um, out in the Redlands area, which is an area between Miami and Homestead, out in the in the ag- which was then sh- almost strictly agricultural. Now it's there's been different communities uh, that have built up in there. Uh, we called El Zapatal, and he had a, about 25 acres in mame trees, which is there uh, a, a fruit that is uh, grows in Cuba abundantly but it's hard to grow in the united states and to have mature mame trees they're, they're worth a lot of money so he had these this compound out in south dade that was off of southwest uh, 192nd street and uh, uh just east of chrome avenue and he had uh, two 
two large house complex on it. He had uh, the training facilities for all his cockfighting birds. He had his own via, which was the, the cockfighting arena. So we decided one of the things we wanted to do was we wanted to see who were his closest associates in South Florida. And we figured the way to do that is to, to start raiding these different cockfighting arenas when battle was in attendance. And we'd find out, you know, who was, we'd identify who was sitting next to him, who was, who was close with him. And, uh, and uh, at first we, we were good at hitting the cockfighting arenas, but, but a lot of the times battle would just have left when we, when we, when we hit him with the, with the, you know, SWAT teams, because there was a lot of guns uh, going on there. People had a lot of cash. They didn't trust each other necessarily. So everybody had bodyguards. So most of the time we hit it with a SWAT team. Yeah, I think it, it's worth mentioning. People who aren't from South Florida may not understand how big this cockfighting thing was. Of course, it was all illegal. Um, but we, we actually had a couple of homicides at these cockfighting oh, yeah. arenas. Oh, yeah. Uh, there was a homicide that we investigated an organized crime along with you. Um, where three guys had broken into one of these uh, these cockfighting arenas when battle was there, and they robbed everybody. And then three, uh, then two days later, they all, all ended up, uh, you know, killed execution style and thrown into a canal in South Dade. I don't know if you remember that one, but, but you know that was one of ours. But um, so yeah, the cockfighting was a big way. It was a big thing in uh, Cuban, the older Cuban American society. And they brought it over and they knew it was illegal in the United States because of, uh, you know, it was felt to be uh, harsh treatment of animals. Um, and th that's where they most of the in most states, that's why cockfighting and dogfighting are illegal because of the uh, of the, the you know treatment of animals. So um, if those are not aware of it, I mean, it's a vicious sport. They get these they get these birds mad at each other. And they attach razors to their claws and then set them on each other. And they, they, they slash each other to death. It's, it's a vicious sport. So we started raiding these cockfighting arenas. And in fact, we had one where we raided it. It was almost comical. It was a large, it was out in, uh, in Hialeah, in Western Hialeah. And it was a large old agricultural building. It had, they, had, they had a restaurant in there. They had a bar. They had the, the cockfighting arena. They had a place where all they would stare, uh, they would, would store the cocks before the arena. And they had a back door, and they didn't want anybody coming through the back door, so they had a, a security guard, um, a security guard posted there. Well, the when we raided this place, we infiltrated the the SWAT team through these agricultural fields to come in, and because the important thing was to freeze everybody so that we could see who was sitting next to who, who were the who was who was friendly with whom. Um, and the security guard tried to stop, you know, 14 black clad um, SWAT members all with uh, automatic weapons. And they just basically knocked him down and, you know, <laughs> and just ran over top of him. And so then when we came in there, here's this poor uh, security guard who's got boot prints all over his white shirt. But anyway, eventually we did catch battle in a number of these cockfights and we did get a real good handle on who his his close associates were so then the 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 problem we took at it from two different angles we put pen registers and trap and traces on battles phones at the at his compound and he had five phones there which he kept busy all all the time and then we started working from the other angle um their best guess in the illegal gambling circles, which would lead us to, in the middle. We find a connection from Jose Miguel Vattle to these operations. That would give us the means to wiretap his phones. And if we could get in there and, and put bug, room bugs in his house, that was the plan. And because I had started this case and I was young and, and energetic at the time, uh, I was tapped to be the lead investigator of the of the of this. It became a monumental, you know. In 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 the the movies, you know, they throw up a wiretap in 15 minutes. Uh, it's 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 a very extensive 
even when you have to do a wiretap, we had to do a wiretap when I was in organized crime was another case from the other side, the tactical side, which involved a, a kidnapping and potential death. Even that took us, you know, it took like 10 detectives working on the paperwork for it, you know, for straight 24 hours so we could get it through to a judge. You need to be able to prove a to a reasonable assumption that there's a crime going on. B that you exhaust all other means of solving this crime and at the last the last resort is to is to tap somebody's phone. Right. And you know, wiretaps for people that don't know, this is not like a search warrant. A wiretap is a is a huge undertaking. Correct. It takes a lot of documentation and planning and, and you know, judges do not uh give these things out like candy. No, they don't. And even look, uh, I mean, even state judges. I mean, we did state uh, sponsored wiretaps and state job judges have very strict guidelines that they have to follow when signing off on it. Now, not only that, now don't you have to follow that. And then there's, a, like I said, that exhaustion part where you, you know, you, you have to show, hey, listen, we tried this, we tried that, we tried that, it, that none of it works. Um, you also have to get a, a prosecutorial agency to sign off on it. So you can't, a police department can't just go and kind of wiretap somebody and they get a judge to sign it. In the state of Florida, the two, the two ones are either the attorney general's office, the state attorney general's office, or the, the head of the, the state attorney. And in, in, in that case, in those days, it was Janet Reno. And Miss Reno was very, uh, I have a lot of respect for her. Uh, having taken a number of wiretaps to her, uh, she was an interesting character. In point of fact, she went through a freaking file at me and Larry Levecchio's head because she was displeased with the the verbiage of the of the of the of the thing. You know, kind of like a frisbee. You know, you know, if it if it had sharp edges, it could have cut our heads off. It's, just, it's almost like some strange rite of passage having a file thrown at you. Yeah, exactly. You know. <laughs> you know? It's a great story, and you know, investigations can, investigations often leave us with some really great tales to tell them. I'm really glad you're here telling that one because I never heard it. Anyway, you've now identified Battle and some of his constituents. Did there come a time when he found out who you were? Like, did, was there a time when he realized David Shanks is on my tail? Years later, I had already put I had put Battle in jail on a number of smaller crimes uh, back in the uh, '90s. So I had a, I was living in Key Largo at the time, and I had um, I had a house that I had built myself. And next door, I had bought this vacant lot, which I incorporated into the, my uh, into my lot. And that vacant lot was my address, as far as the police department was determined, uh, concerned. And I had a mailbox on there, and I rented the house out. Every couple of days, I would go by that mailbox that was sitting on the vacant lot, and I would collect my mail. And um, so one day, I'm walking up to the the mailbox. I'm about to open the mailbox, and I think I hear the distinctive rattlings of a, of a rattlesnake. So, I mean, Key Largo, when I was a child, they still had some rattlesnakes around, but it, you know, with all of the, the buildup, they were like, they weren't around. So I looked around, I couldn't find it. So I went back to the mailbox and I started to touch the mailbox and I felt and heard the rattling inside of it. So I peeked, I opened up the mailbox, like an eighth of an inch and and sure enough, there was a very angry rattlesnake in there and closed it. And I closed it down. And uh, this is four foot off the ground. There's no way he could have climbed in there on himself and locked himself in. So I immediately took out my nine millimeter and <laughs> and did basically two clips into there to make sure he was dead. And I talked to some of my neighbors and they said, yeah, there was two two guys, two, two Hispanic looking guys who came by that mailbox earlier today and they were fiddling around. So I knew it was Jose Miguel Battle sending me a message. He didn't like what I was doing. So I took the mailbox apart and went and bought a new one. I put cement in. I cut the rattles off of the rattlesnake and then filled the box with cement and gave it a Viking burial. And then I mailed the rattlesnakes back to him, back to battle, the, the rattles. <laughs> That's pretty great. You know, most of us go into police work. We never dream that we're going to be shooting a snake one day. But did, did you ever come face to face with battle did you ever talk to him uh we went to interview battle when he was in the prisoner ward and he battle said to us you know you two won't won't be happy until i die uh penniless and in jail will you 
And neither of us, you know, we're trying to be professional. Neither of us said, well, we're just doing our job. But both of us afterwards, we, we left the prisoner ward going, yeah, that's pretty much what we want. <laughs> you think you can help us out a little bit? Yeah, exactly. David, you know that sometimes you have to get creative in these types of investigations. What was the most unusual thing you did in this case? Uh, so in that beginning of the investigation, when I was trying to link up these these two things, the organization with him, we had a case where there was a, a conspiracy to, to kill a prisoner in the in prison. And it turned out that this guy who was in uh, the South Dade, uh, the state South Dade Correctional Institute down south there, uh, Florida City, had shot two of Battle's collectors. And the one guy was Battle's bodyguard. So we thought, man, we have got it right here. Here it is. Here's this guy, this, 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 this conspiracy to kill this guy in prison. And it involves the, uh, it's, it's a payback for the shooting Battle's bodyguard. So we thought we had the, you know, the crown jewels there. So the plan was the inside man was the son of one of what we believe was Battle's illegal uh, gambling operations. She, it was, uh, her name was Esperanza, Esperanza Arroz, and she, her son was in doing, doing five years, doing a five-year bit in prison, and he, he was a sailmate of the guy who had shot Battle's bodyguard. So uh, we did. We got a wiretap up on her phone, and then we, we threw, a, threw an informant. We introduced Kenny Rosario as a someone who could, inter, who could make poison that could be introduced into the, the person's food in prison. So we had fake poison made up and and introduced Kenny as this as this contract killer who would provide poison. And um, it all kind of worked. I mean, we had uh, Kenny introduced the fake poison. The, the the intended victim was in on it. He knew that once the uh, that the poison got introduced into the prison, that uh, that when and where they were going to introduce it to his food. And he would go back to his cell and 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 do fake convulsions. And we we actually brought in a, a fire rescue team, which actually had one one fireman and three policemen, three detectives dressed up as fire as, as paramedics to whisk him out of the prison. And then the plan was we had a fake death certificate. We had the hospital in on it. If somebody called into the hospital, they'd say, oh, "Yeah, that guy died." On arrival, if they called into the medical examiner's office, they would say, yeah, the, that we had the whole thing wired. And the plan was for Esperanza de Rose then to report the fact that she that they'd, they, they had killed this guy and so that she could collect the money and then hear, see the phone calls traveling to Battle's phone. Because we had the wiretap, we had didn't have, we had wiretaps on Esperanza, but we didn't have it on Battle. But we had all these pen registers and trap and traces, which would take us directly to Battle's phone. David, I'll just jump in real quick for those who may not be familiar with these terms. Oh yeah, a pen register is a device that identifies outgoing calls from a particular line, and a trap trace does just the opposite. It identifies incoming numbers to a particular line. Just wanted to clarify that. So it was brilliant up until the point of fact of when we came in the next morning after all this happened and we thought we had to hit a home run, the technical people had told me that somebody had gotten into the the uh, the telephone boxes that were adjacent to – that handled the, the telephone service into Battle's house and stolen all of our equipment. So we got the telephone calls from Esperanza to her boss and then her boss to somebody else. And then the then the, the the basically the lines of transmission died because all the equipment that we had on Battle's house, which would have recorded the incoming phone from that person, had been stolen. And the only person that could the only people who could have stolen it would have been personnel on on the pay of Battle who were telephone employees, because you had to have a special key to get into the box. So that was one of the first things that happened that told us that we had to be extremely careful how information got out related to this case. The amount of man hours that were spent on this, I, it just boggles the mind. W what was this like on your personal life, David? Well, I was never home. It needs to say that I spent 18 years investigating him from when from that first case until it was finally brought to a conclusion. 
18 years. That's over half your 18 career. years. Yes. It was my career case. Having a rattlesnake put in your box made my ex-wife very nervous about it. I spent a lot of time with the, the boys as much as I could, and I did. But I, have a, I would disappear for weeks at a time. I was doing wiretaps, and I would have a, a cot in the, in, the, in the listening post, and I wouldn't come home for, for weeks. Um, in point of fact, there was one of the – it kind of was a culmination of everything. I had finally taken off uh, some time to do a vacation where uh, Patsy and I and the boys were going up to a um, place in North Carolina to have a vacation. And uh, long story short, we got up there, and the first morning, two FBI agents knock on the condo door and say, uh, you got to come back to Miami because we've had an emergency. So she was left with two very young, uh, rambunctious boys to get back by, via car back to South Florida. So that went over like a, a lead balloon. And it just it, the, the marriage just totally dissipated. So battle during that period of time between the 60s and the and the 90s, he had gained so much power that he became uh, first an equal to the five families in New York City and the and the New New Jersey Mafia, and then he became more powerful than that. And by the five families, you're referring to the Italian Cosa Nostra, or the Italian Mafia. Yeah, that's correct. The five names that are known, you know, the Gambinos, the, the you know the yeah, Blue Chases, all of those are five families that that uh, that split up power in New York, uh, New York City. He decided that he needed to be known as the as the the guy who would that uh, for the slightest offense would have you killed. And he traded on that on that reputation, and he had people killed left and right. When we did the the RICO investigation uh, in the early two th- late nineties and early two thousands. You know, we went after 15 provable homicides, either by arson or by by gun. But we had to choose from like 150. 150. So to put that in perspective, when I was working the Whitey Bulger case out of Boston, we identified 21 murders. And that took an incredible amount yes. of work. And, and sometimes we think that's a, a, a was a low number. But, I mean, we had to whittle down what was our best cases to go with when we did the racketeering investigation. And one of them was that we did go with was one of the early killings that um, happened in not the beginning of his career, but in the early part, say the early third, he had um, a brother battle went to jail for a year on an FBI beef, which turned out to be a, he fled the country and all he got convicted of was, illegal flight to avoid prosecution. So he did a year in Danbury. And um, while he was there, his brothers, he had four brothers, were running his operation. And one of them was, uh, the youngest one was was Pedro. And Pedro was um, not as hard as the other brothers. I mean, the other brothers had gone through the Bay of Pigs. They had been, worked for the, either the Havana Police Department, which was not, not kind, just to say the least. And one of the one of the brothers was um, reputed to have worked for the cash uh, for Batista's secret police. So they these were all hard hardened fellows. And Pedro wasn't as hard, but he was trying to emulate his brothers. So while Battle uh, was in all these legal troubles, there's two incidents that occurred. One, um, Gustavo Battle uh, got into a running. A gun battle in the streets of Miami started at a old car. There used to be car dealerships up on 27th Avenue by 36th Street. So it started there where there used to be these these used cars. And so Gustavo just bought a brand new Buick, and he spotted these rival gangs uh, scoping them out across the street. So he called Pedro. Pedro brought some guns. So they started a running ga- ga- uh, gun battle down 27th Avenue, down the Southwest 8th Street, ran all around the little Havana and ended up on, uh, on Southwest 8th Street and Red Road. So it was like a 10-mile running gun battle. And the three cars that were chasing him, two of them got knocked out. So there's one car left, and that's 
uh, two guys in a VW. Somewhere along the line, uh, Pedro lost the got lost in the in the shuffle, and uh, he's trailing way behind on on this on this gun battle, and they end up crashing together. This VW and and now uh, Gustavo battles bullet ridden for what was a brand new Buick. Um, so B- Gustavo gets out with two forty fives, and he faces off nose to nose with these these uh, the last two. Uh, the two assailants, you know, they, one of them had a, a carbine and other had uh, weapons. Anyway, he, he shoots and kills one of them. And then the guy, uh, the guy who had the carbine is carbine jammed. So he starts running away. Uh, Gustavo battle who's wounded himself several times, jumps in the car and runs the guy down and then crashes into a telephone pole. Pedro battle shows up there, sees what he thinks is his brother dead so and he hears the sirens coming and he hauls ass. Well, Gustavo Battle lives. And Pedro was trying to live down the kind of the shame of, of deserting his brother. So he starts, one of Battle's rules in the early days was no drugs in the areas where we're selling, uh, doing illegal, illegal gambling. And not because he was against drugs. It was because he felt that if you were doing drug deals, that attracted more police attention. So he didn't want drug dealing associated with his illegal gambling operations because he felt that they got less attention. Sure, that's a pretty smart policy. More criminals should have used it. Very smart policy. And uh, we know this because of, uh, years later, uh, people who we uh, we jammed up and they, they basically told us about the early days. So, but while battles in jail on this UFAP, um, Pedro decides that he's going to set up these adjacent to these illegal gambling spots, these narcotic uh, dealing, street corner narcotics. What happens is there's a there's a conflict with an, another rival Cuban organization uh, called The Company, and it's run by a guy by the name of Jose Gonzalez, known by, as Palulu. So Battle sends one of his uh, – Battle, Pedro Battle sends one of his – underlings to take over the street corner and in so doing this the a gunfight and, and one of Palulo's people gets killed so there is now a really a lot of animus between these two organizations and early 70s 73 I think just before Christmas Pedro Battle is in a bar on uh, Amsterdam Avenue in New York City uh, St. Nick's uh, St. Nicholas Avenue, not Amsterdam. And at the same time, in another part of the bar is Palulu, who's celebrating with some of his people. So an argument uh, erupts, and Pedro Battle thinks that he's you know trying to be as tough as his brother, so he pulls a gun and starts shooting, and Palulu pulls a bigger gun and kills Pedro Battle. Battle just got out of prison for the for the unlawful flight, and so now he's enraged. He wants he wants Palulu dead. At his brother's funeral, he declares that he wants the the head and the balls of of Palulu mounted on his wall. The sooner the better. Puts out two different contracts. If you kill Palulu, you get like twenty uh, twenty five or fifty thousand dollars. But if you bring Palulu to battle, so battle can kill him himself, it's a double. It's a double the amount. So two guys who become very important to battle approach him at the wake, and one of them was Palulu's right hand man, one of his enforcers, one of his killers, and he says, "I can show you, you know, who the Palulu's people are, so that we can catch Palulu." And the other one was the guy who worked for Pedro, who killed the street corner uh, narcotics guy, which started this feud. So Battle takes both of them in and says, "Listen, we're gonna we're gonna hit we're gonna form hit squads." Enforcer from Palulo is named Chino Acuna, and what happens is they form these hit squads to go out and kidnap. Uh, and they're not more than just one hit squad. They form like five or six of them. And they form these hit squads to go out and capture people who work for the Pluto organization and torture them. And um, most of the time they kill them after they get the information. Sometimes they let them loose 
so the word will get out on the street that, you know, if you know anywhere the whereabouts of Palulu, you need to come in and tell because they're going to torture you and kill you. So this starts a, like a four-month, five-month situation in New York City where this, this, these tortures, torturing and, and kidnappings and killings are going on. And finally, uh, they found out information that uh, Ernestico Torres, who that was the killer, and his friend Charlie Hernandez and Chino Kuna, find out that Palulu, in order to keep his illegal organization up and running, is meeting his underlings in Central Park in New York City. So they ambush him in Central Park, and it starts a gun battle, which goes all through the park out north and uh, through the north exit. And uh, when the NYPD started investiga investigating, they found something like 250 spent shells spread around the, the path of destruction as they went north. And what happens is Palulu gets shot in the leg, and they leave him for dead because it was a major wound to the upper thigh and is bleeding profusely. But he happened to be two blocks from a hospital, and they save his life. He loses his leg, but they save his life. So that starts like an eight-year odyssey where they try, to, they try to kill Palulu numerous times, in prison, out of prison, 13 different attempts on his life. And the guy keeps living. He gets shot in the head one time, and he still lives. The bullet ricochets around his skull and co comes in the front and ricochets around the skull and comes out the back. He gets, he gets shot numerous times. So the more that this is going on, the more enraged battle becomes about his arch nemesis dying and getting the street cred of being Superman. So finally, Palulu is walking, limping around New York City, and while he's on the sidewalk, he gets boxed in by two, uh, two vans, four shooters emerge, and they pump him. He's shot 13 times, and as he's about to pass out. He feels somebody rolling him over, and here's Jose Miguel, Miguel Battles, standing over top of him saying, I told you I'd get you one day. You know, die, you son of a bitch. Hijo de puta. Again, they hear sirens. They, they bail. He's one block from St. Barnabas Hospital in, in the Bronx. They take him there, and they, he survives again. And he comes out of a coma 10 days later, and he tells the detective who worked with most of these cases by the name of Richie Califas, who those of you who remember the old McLeod series, the cowboy who was detective in New York City, Richie Califas was that's that's your mental picture. He tells him about this thing, and they're going to arrest battle for this so attempted homicide. And a, a person, a male, dressed up as a male nurse, comes in and puts two in his forehead in his hospital room, and finally kills Palulu. So it also ends the case the, uh, of the attempted homicide. Over, over an eight-year period of time. Palulu has three bodyguards that are killed. One of the, the hitmen for battle was this, uh, was this um, Ernestico Torres and becomes promoted in the organization, and he does some really stupid things, and he's thrown out. And because of that, he starts kidnapping some of battle's bankers, including his brother-in-law, to ransom him back, and there's another gunfight. And Anyway, now he's... Public en because Palulu's in jail, he's public enemy number one. So he there's there's a several attempts on his life in New York City. One of them was a car bombing, where he escaped only because when he opened the car door, he heard the ping of the grenade that was wiretapped to the to the uh, to the gas tank flip open, and he runs and he he barely survives. Another time he shot a couple of times, so he flees to Miami. And is, uh, there's a couple attempts on his life there, and they finally track him down in Opalaka, an uh, apartment in Scheherazade in Opalaka. And four gunmen, Battle and, uh, Battle and Gustavo Battle, Chino Kuna, and another guy break in this apartment midday. They shoot uh, Hernandez's girlfriend in the head, think they kill her, and they have a gun battle in the, uh, outside the bedroom, and they finally kill Ernestico Torres. That leads to Battle being arrested again and getting being convicted for it in the, in the courts of Dade County. So while he's there in jail, he eventually gets out, of, uh, out, he, he gets out on an appeal for after three years. He keeps running through his raindrops in the early days. His, he takes in a partner 
uh, guy named Abraham Rids. And Abraham Rids and Battle's son take Battle's organization and they multiply it by like five or six times. And they recruit a lot of Mariolito criminals who can come to the United States to be their soldiers. And they become very big. So they start having this, the, while Battle was in jail for that homicide, he meets up with one of the, the godfathers who's in jail for a, a concrete fixing thing in New York City. And they agree to this, this rule. It's called the two-block rule. So how it worked was if, if I had an illegal spot, no one could, no other competing organization could operate in a two-block radius. It worked very well for a number of years, but when Battles gets out of jail after this, he sees this huge organization is bringing all this money, and he realizes that he has more power than the Italians. So he starts telling the Italians, I'm not going to pay you off anymore. In point of fact, the two-block rule, forget about it. So what it starts is an arson war. They start burning out each other's places. And since Battle had more soldiers, they're burning out more of the Italian places than the Italians are burning out Battle's places. Yeah, they were just uh, uh, low, low tech. They would walk in. I mean, we turned one of the one of the arsonists who who eventually turned state's evidence against them. But it was low tech. They'd walk in with a can of gasoline. They'd throw gasoline down on the floor, light a match, then close the front door and lock up and but and bolt and lock them into the into this. You know, most of these were operated out of bodegas, shoe shop places, you know, wherever they could, they had these little storefronts that they operated out of. And whether the people got out through a back door or not, they didn't give a care. They didn't care. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, I grew up in Little Havana and point of fact, part of my family is, is, has, is, is, is Hispanic. So I grew up in, in Little Havana and my, my, many of my friends uh, during that 1980 period, and I was already, I'd left Liberty City after the riots. It was down the, and there when they landed. Castro said, "Let's. I'll open up the ports. You can come get your relatives." What he didn't say is when they come over, came over with their boats. And now most of these Hispanic Americans uh, are now Hispanic Americans. They, you know, become they Americanize themselves. They come over with a with a nice boat. You know, they can go the ninety miles across the strait. They would they collect their family members, say four or five of them, and then Castro soldiers would say, "Okay." Your boat can hold 12, so here you go. you got seven criminals you got to take back with you to the United States. There's a story you shared with me when we first started talking about this case, and it was, it was just one of those riveting stories that I can't forget, and certainly you did not, and it kept you going. Tell us how that happened, and what, what was this story that was so unusual and so emotional for you? The thing that kept me going for 18 years was... One of these arson wars involved an innocent bystander, a three-year-old girl who was her babysitter, an 18-year-old babysitter, who was extremely close to the fam- uh, family of this three-year-old girl, went to visit her boyfriend in one of these illegal spots. And when they set fire to it, the three-year-old girl got killed and the 18-year-old babysitter got killed. The boyfriend was blinded for life. After I talked to the mother of that three-year-old girl. And many times it's hard for me to get through the story, but I will attempt. Um, It was so poignant about the loss of her her three-year-old daughter that that's what kept me going for 18 years. How she talked about, they went to the hospital and uh, they waited for 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 the babysitter and the girl to come for hours. Didn't know where they were. They finally find out that she's in the hospital. Uh, they go to the hospital, and she's getting no word on how her three-year-old daughter is. And so she's walking, pacing out the side of the hospital, and her husband knows now that the child is dead, and he brings her the child's jewelry and hands it to her, and he's so broken up that he can't say the words, and he just hands her the jewelry. Uh, that story just hit home with me, that these people were killing innocence and they didn't care whatever brought the arson wars to an end well the arson wars stopped because of the publicity of all these innocent deaths so the 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 italians finally sue for peace 
point of fact, there was a wiretap that uh, we had in our possession where the uh, Italians are have a dispute after the arson wars are over, talking about, you know, you guys have intruded in a neighborhood that we've controlled for years. Um, you need to back off or we'll send some soldiers to solve it. And, and the corporation guy goes, listen, we beat you once. We, be, we can do it again. If you send five soldiers, I'm going to send 50. If you send 50, I'm going to send 100. If you send 100, I'm going to send 1,000. You know that we have more more people at our beck and call than you do. So just shut up. And the Italian did. So what happens is after that, 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 that foray into there, I start this. I started basically a three prong attack on the battle organization. We start doing wiretaps on these um, different illegal organizations, uh, operations getting higher and higher in the, in the scheme of things. And the, the higher and higher means that, you know, they have banks of money, you know, uh, a small operator has maybe $50,000 to ensure if he gets hit by, a, by something, he can, he can pay it off. And then he can get that money back. It's it's a steady it's a steady stream of money that's coming in constantly. If you lose a little money along the line because somebody gets lucky on a bet, doesn't matter. More money's coming in behind it. So I start doing a, a taking a, a, a I'm a very big history guy taking a MacArthur strategy in the Pacific. I start leapfrogging. I start leapfrogging different people. When I learned this is another guy higher in the organization, I look at his phone records see who he's talking to. And then if I, I start looking at who that guy's talking to, and many times I'll skip over the middle guy to get to the higher one, the one who's got more money behind him. He has 250,000, a half a million dollars behind. That was my pop. That was the one attack. We started another thing of looking at finances and we had to be very careful at that because we knew that a lot of the different banks that the battle organization was funneling money into were, uh, you know, the ocean, old ocean bank down there, they tell the they tell the criminal in five seconds if you hit them with a subpoena about their financial records. The third one was we started looking at Jose Miguel Battle Jr. And Abraham Rids had started opening up these legitimate businesses, a loan company, a clothing manufacturer, this, where they were washing the money. And so we looked at the, the financials of that, of how they were getting the money to these different money laundering operations that they had. And then the fourth prong was we started hitting um, people who were had been arrested and were facing major time uh, for illegal not narcotics and trying to get them to talk about the battle organization. And one of the people that we jammed up really bad and during was kind of a cross between the two. We stopped on the streets of Miami and we showed them we have we have all the stuff on you. You're facing 10, 15 years in jail. And the, and the guy says, listen, just like Palulu back in the beginning, I will talk about anybody you want, but I won't talk about any Los Patles because if you do, they will, and they find out about it, they will kill you without a doubt. And then the, there was a fifth track. I was, I worked a lot of these homicides. I worked along with you, Rom, you know, we talk, worked on a couple of homicides. Uh, I worked with the NYPD up there. I worked with Union City. Um, we worked with all these the homicides to try to get them get them focused into some people. So I came I came at it all different directions that I could. I was lucky that after 1996 I was taken over to uh, work for the U.S. Attorney's Office and basically head the the battle strike force organization. I had uh, detectives working uh, for me. I had FBI agents out of Miami and and New York City and Union City and the state, you know, FDLE. I had, I had the whole alphabet soup. I mean, I don't think I missed one who, who didn't work on the task force at some point or another. We effectively chased battle out of the country um, in 94. He knew that we were getting close to him. So he took a, he got a forged passport and he fled to uh, Lima, Peru. And he used the name Alfredo Wallet. And uh, Fredo Wallet was the was a two year old child who died, and they got uh, they got his identification, and they applied for a passport and under Battle's name. And that way, in the old days, that was a, a good way to get a a passport from uh, an unforged identity. And uh, so he and they op they opened up a casino down there, and the casino 
turned out to be one of the linchpins of the investigation because that's and I, uh, I, uh, I then spent years either going down to Lima to investigate to the, to Europe to the Caribbean islands all over the place investigating all these tendrils that they had the companies they had started and had had and, but the one that was the key was was Lima because when he got down there Battle was so drunk with the fact that everybody knew him as the godfather, a mafia godfather, that he couldn't just go down there and shut up. He had to talk. He had to tell people. And the Peruvians, they were willing to talk about what he said. And one of the things we found out that they'd, they'd funneled like $10 million down there to, uh, to open up and uh, run this casino and it was all cash transactions. So it was the, it was it was one of the tips of the iceberg of of the financial uh, investigation, and that led to a, a CPA by the name of Orestes Vedan, who worked with Battle Junior and and um, Rids uh, on setting up all these shelf corporations so that they could funnel money back and forth from South America, the Caribbean islands, to to Switzerland, to to France where they would shuttle cash around and uh, they would basically set up a shelf corporation. And those who don't know what a shelf corporation is, that's a corporation that's set up in a South or Central American country. A lot of them in Panama where they're set up in advance by a, basically a cor- corrupt lawyer who sets up a corporation. He sets up a small bank account in locally, say in Panama city. And somebody goes down there and says, okay, I need a corporation to establish that I'm going to do to start funding funneling money down to the United States and he'll take he'll take this corporation and his paperwork off the shelf and sell it to them and with their with their pre pre-established bank account. So what the battles were doing was they were taking cash down to South America and to Switzerland and to the islands and they were putting them they were putting them in these accounts that um, that they set up and then they were loaning themselves back the money to these legitimate companies that they were setting up in Miami and New, and New York City and paying back themselves in loans. So it made the money look clean. They buy houses this way. I mean, they had tons of real estate in South Florida. In the end, when we, when we go to arrest everybody, I have hundreds of thousands of documents that we have that I, that I collected through the investigation to sort out how they were laundering their money. When starting in 1996, when I went to the U.S. Attorney's Office, the decision had been to to go for a a RICO indictment. We start building this RICO case, uh, which involved prosecuting them for the illegal gambling, prosecuting them for the the homicides, for the the white-collar crimes they did, the the truck hijackings they did, all of it, you know, uh, the alphabet soup. And it took years to build that case from basically 96 until 2004. And, that, and part of that also was that the finances, circling the finances back to the illegal activities, just showing that all this money was gained illegally. Our listeners should know that the amount of paperwork you're talking about, I mean, this is all evidence. Correct. This is a chain of custody nightmare, a management nightmare, and it's a full-time job for at least three or four people. That's correct. This is probably a good time, maybe a little late, but better late than never. There's a book uh, out on this entire investigation and this entire saga of Jose Miguel Battle and the corporation, and it is called The Corporation. How how did this come to be? Yeah, I mean, I when I retired in '07, people kept telling me how what a great story this was. So I wrote, I wrote, and we wrote an 800 page thesis on the battle case and tried to get it sold. We couldn't. So my business partners and I had this brilliant idea. English TJ had written this book about uh, about uh, called Havana Nocturne, which was about the mafia in in Havana uh, before uh, while the Batista presidency was in, in place in power and before Castro. So we we had a contract with with English to rewrite my our book. And so he did. He wrote his own version of the based on the I'd say 80 percent of the facts that he has in the book come from this 800 pages that that came out of my mind. How do you and your team finally bring this whole thing down, David? Well, on 
the day after St. Patrick's Day in 2004, I'm, I am 20 days from retiring, and um, I hit my 30th year. And the deal was I was going to we were going to take all these cases down and then I was going to go work directly for the U.S. attorney's office, which is what happened. So we go out and uh, this is like the third time we've done massive search warrants. But this one is the big the bit of daddy of all times. We serve search warrants, basically 50 to 60 simultaneous search warrants on locations that we believe records would be found. We served 26 arrest warrants for racketeering on the higher higher echelon of the corporation, including Battle, his son, his brother-in-law, uh, Abraham Rids, the Don, who's the architect, one of the architects of the money laundering scheme, Chino Kuna, one of the one of the um, the hitmen, and, and this is just not here in the United States. We had, and we also at the same time served simultaneously seizure orders on property and and bank accounts worldwide so it all had to be done simultaneously so the plan was since some of the things were in europe manuel marquez who's uh, who was one of battles uh, is like number three man in the organization he was hiding out in spain so we uh, how we did it was they arrested marquez in spain uh, agents federal agents working in the different embassies around the world, did seizure orders, working with the, with the governments of those countries on the bank accounts and property. And then once I got, I was back in the United States, and once we got clearance that all these things were done in Europe and in the Caribbean islands, then we went out and I had 224 detectives and agents. We went out um, and arrested uh, all these people and served uh, the bank uh, bank seizures here in the United States and property seizures and they committed and did search warrants and and then papered other people in the uh, battle circle like we did 150 grand jury subpoenas all at simultaneous basically simultaneously worldwide it took months to put all those ducks in a row the only the only problem that uh, that arose in the whole thing was when we went to arrest Battle's son, he we found out when we hit his house that he was on a 25-year anniversary cruise in the Caribbean with his wife. So that created all kinds of problems. We knew that their next port of call did not have extradition with the United States. So after starting at like 4 o'clock in the morning with coordinating with Europe and then the all the hitting of the of the of the warrants and everything here in the United States um, early the next morning and then processing all the prisoners and then interviewing all the prisoners. I had to then spend the next five hours till three o'clock in the morning uh, working with the Pentagon to get a Navy ship to stop the the cruise line ship. So about two o'clock in the morning, I am on the phone with the Admiral from the Coast Guard, a Navy captain from the Pentagon and a chairman of the board of this of this cruise line. The Navy cat, the, the the chairman of the board is kind of hem and haw, and he doesn't want to he doesn't want to create a furor on his ship. And the Navy captain says, "I have a guided missile frigate, the USS Gates, that can intercept you just before you enter the territorial waters, but it'll be after dawn when you know you have passengers who are starting to get up and 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 you're going to witness us throwing a shot across your bows to stopping your ship." And the chairman of the board goes. What coordinates do you want to meet? So he blinked. And so they, they, they met up at, at like four o'clock in the morning and it's, the Coast Guard team went over and I was, they had a neat communication system where I could listen to the whole thing, motoring over in the, in the uh, large uh, Zodiac over to the cruise ship, breaking into the room, dragging him out by his heels and taking him to, back to the Navy ship under arrest. And then transferring him, then he got transferred to Guantanamo Bay for a short period of time. <laughs> Not many policemen get to do that, David. No, man. I've had people say, "How do you do that?" And I said, "It's just like a, a regular felony stop, except you got a much much larger vehicle." You have to be Jack Ryan for a day. Yeah, exactly. So this immense operation is over, and you've got everybody in custody. How does it all end, and how does Battle's demise finally come into focus? 
starting when I arrested him, we arrested him in 94, he had kidney failure because he was two things, the personal things that battle had developed over the years. He had purposely developed the, um, the Corleone voice imitating the, the Godfather from the original Godfather movie, the Marlon Brando voice. And the other thing is, along with that persona that he tried to project, he also got heavily into drugs and he basically, like cocaine had burned out his, his kidneys. So he was on dialysis starting in uh, 94 when we arrested him. He does his bit in jail and he's still out and he's out and he's still going to regular dialysis. His attorney, he, he, he basically quotes all these things that battle's going to be dying within two years. Ten years later, he's still alive. So we have the same issues with him again. So we, we, we take him into custody. All these uh, battle cronies, or most of them, don't get, get released from jail because they're, they're dangerous. And point of fact, we've inter- intercepted one homicide conspiracy that they wanted to kill one of the, one of the witnesses that, that they had figured out had, was testifying against them. We hold them all in jail. One who finally turns on them, one of the higher ups, is, is a- Abraham Ritz. His wife has brain cancer. He wants to be out to help her. So he originally, he tells us, he tells us all. He tells us about the homicides. He tells how the, how the money laundering worked. He tell he gave us A to Z and we use him as a witness. So battle ends up in trial. Um, two years later, it took us two years to prep the trial. We had arrested his paramour uh, as part of the case because she had helped him with some of the money laundering. And he agrees about halfway through the case. He realizes that his son may get a life's term because we're able to paint the son a very bad picture because we're able to introduce all this stuff about the father. And so we might cut a deal where he'll go to jail um, for the rest of his life and and we will we will uh, null process the, the case against the paramour. Uh, after we convictions on the son and everyone else, about four months later, he dies in uh, a medical facility uh, run by the uh, Bureau of Prisons, uh, penniless and all his power gone. It, it's a success. And we get to seize $1.4 billion worth of illegal assets as part of the RICO investigation. A Herculean effort, uh, David, on the part of you and your team. And has to be one of the largest seizures in history, no? Yeah, it became it was the largest seizure until Bernie Madoff came along. My guest for the last hour or so has been David Shanks, retired criminal investigator who spearheaded the investigation, apprehension, and prosecution of Jose Miguel Battle, arguably one of the most amazing and far-reaching cases that you'll find anywhere in the annals of criminal history in the United States. David, I'm so grateful that you are with me today, and as always, it's great to catch up with you. You're a great friend, and um, uh, thanks again for spending the time to talk about your role in this uh, remarkable story. Well, you know, it, it, we worked, like I said, started through probably 83 or so. And we've kept close contact for all those years. And um, you were a great homicide detective and, a, and a, a great friend. So I'm glad to do this. Much appreciated. And I know our listeners appreciate it as well. So, David, take care. And we'll talk again soon. Okay. Bye. So that was pretty great, right? You don't get to hear stories like that very often. In fact, as a law enforcement person, you don't get to be involved in something that far-reaching and that challenging very often. David was very fortunate to have that kind of experience. It did take a toll on him, as you heard, but he got through it and, and was instrumental in putting away one of the most savage and brutal crime lords we've seen in this country. I hope you enjoyed it. I'd love to hear your feedback. Don't forget, go to Patreon and learn how you can support the show with just a small donation, and you'll get all kinds of great perks, discounts on some of my training videos, and a free book, a free copy of my book, if that's the 10 must-haves to be a great detective. What I released earlier this year on Amazon, it's on Kindle ebook and is available also in paperback. And learn how you can get a free copy by just being a patron of the show. Thanks for sticking with me. We've got a lot more coming up in future episodes, more interviews, more detectives. Let me know who you are. Let me know what you think of this episode and the show in general. And until then, I'll see you on the next episode. Remember, always put your best foot forward, but don't forget to work on your other foot. Take care, guys. 